10 Missing Persons Cases with Strange Sightings Whenever someone goes missing and their disappearance garners a lot of publicity, it's inevitable that investigators will be flooded with tips from eyewitnesses claiming to have seen the victim. In most cases, these eyewitness sightings are never officially confirmed to be genuine, and it usually turns out that the witness saw someone else and mistook them for the missing person. However, there are some cases in which eyewitnesses will provide specific details to make investigators believe that their sighting might be credible. While the following missing persons cases are still unsolved, they all contain some very unusual eyewitness sightings that caused everyone to look at the case in a very different light. 1. The Unsolved Disappearance of Joan Rich. In 1961, Joan Rich vanished from her Massachusetts home, leaving behind two children, a distraught husband, and a kitchen streaked in blood. At approximately 4.30 p.m. On October 24, 1961, Sergeant Michael McHugh of the Lincoln, Massachusetts Police Department received a phone call. On the other end of the line was Barbara Barker, a woman living on Old Bedford Road. McHugh listened as Barker expressed concern about the well-being of her neighbor, Joan Rich. Barker explained that she had just been to the Rich home and found blood all over the kitchen floor. Joan, however, was nowhere in sight. McHugh hung up and arrived at the Cape Cod style home in less than five minutes. He entered through the side door and found himself in the kitchen. The floor was smeared in blood, the table was overturned, and the handset of the wall-mounted telephone had been ripped from its cradle, it hung awkwardly on the edge of a small trash pail. McHugh first believed he was dealing with a suicide. He searched the entire house for a body, but came up empty. He also walked the perimeter of the home, looking for clues, but couldn't find a thing. Then, McHugh telephoned the station and told them to pull the plug, which meant to send out the whole department, for assistance in searching the surrounding woods. When the rest of the officers arrived, Police Chief Leo Algio encountered the neighbor who first called the authorities, Barbara Barker. Barker recalled how she had seen Joan outside around 2.30 p.m. That day, wearing a skirt, sweater, and a gray trench coat. Barker also remembered seeing Joan carrying something red but could not say what it was. She said Joan was leveled and faithful, meaning that Joan would not have had any male company in her husband's absence. According to her statement, Barker had gone shopping and returned around 4.15 p.m. Shortly after, Joan's young daughter, Lillian, had run to Barker's home, crying about not being able to find her mommy, and about her baby brother being left in his crib unattended. Barker took Lillian and David to another neighbor's house across the street inspected the Rich home, and called the police. Chief Algio ordered a search of the local hospitals. After another sweep of the home, additional blood was found on the wall near the telephone, on the door frame between the kitchen and dining room, and on the telephone box. Almost all of the blood had dried except for a few pulled spots on the floor. All signs pointed to a struggle. Strangely, the phone directory was open to a page that listed emergency numbers. Outside, the police also noticed some slight damage to the Rich car. The woods were searched with bloodhounds, without success. Police turned their attention to Joan's husband, Martin Rich, who had been out of town for the day. He was summoned back to Lincoln, and brought to the police barracks where police took his statement. Martin stated that he left his home at 6.50 a.m. on October 24, and had driven to Logan Airport for his flight to New York City. He explained his actions throughout the day including phone calls he had made, as well as the name of the hotel where he had been staying until the police contacted him at 7 o'clock p.m. That evening, Martin Rich described his wife as a shy woman. He informed the police that her daily routine seldom changed, and stressed the fact that she never left the children alone. When questioned about the contents of the trash pail on the kitchen floor, Martin could account for everything, except for the presence of empty beer bottles. The damage to the car, he recalled, was either from himself or Joan bumping off the garage doors. He did admit that his wife was often susceptible to the door-to-door -door solicitations of traveling salesmen. The only extracurricular activity she engaged in was with the Women's League of Voters. The following day, the FBI was notified of Joan Rich's disappearance. Six days later, the town of Lincoln offered a $500 reward for information on Joan's whereabouts. By November, there were still no answers. The FBI could not determine whether or not the amount of blood found in the Rich kitchen was substantial enough to indicate a murder. Additionally, 
The newspapers published reports that a suspicious man had been seen lurking near the home just before the incident, which the FBI dismissed as unfounded. The consensus was that Joan Rich had not been abducted or victimized, but that she had hemorrhaged. The blood type in the kitchen matched Joan's, or caused a self-inflicting wound, then left the home of her own accord. Information soon materialized that a dazed and bloody woman fitting Joan's description was seen running along Route 128 on the date of her disappearance. Police responded by dispatching divers to search the nearby reservoir. Departments in other states were notified, as were relatives in Connecticut, New York, Florida, and California. Nothing turned up. The daughter of the Riz's other neighbors, the Keens, claimed she saw a strange car on their street on the day of Joan's disappearance. Several leads on this mysterious car, which might have been blue, were explored, all with no success. The FBI continued to assist Massachusetts State Police whenever possible. But, because there was no proof that Joan Rich was lying dead somewhere outside of Massachusetts, the FBI could not consider it a federal violation. Thus, its hands were tied, and agents could to do little else than sit on the sidelines. On January 3, 1962, Boston's record American newspaper offered a $5,000 reward to mobilize a public search for Joan Rich. The newspaper also ran several pages detailing an hour-by-hour -hour retrace of Joan's activities on the afternoon of October 24, 1961. There were more details about the crime scene, the amount of blood, and the discovery of three distinct fingerprints, none of which could be traced to anyone, including, because of her absence, Joan. No further leads came and the reward went unclaimed. There has never been a definitive explanation for the fate of Joan Rich. Independent investigators have theorized that Joan was murdered by an intruder, and that her body was taken to Lexington, Massachusetts, to be buried on a vacant patch of land that later became a subdivision named Springdale Estates. Some believe Joan staged her own disappearance, when it was discovered that she had been checking out library books about disappearances immediately prior to her own. Others think Joan's disappearance might somehow have been related to her traumatic childhood. She was adopted after her parents died in what was reported as a suspicious house fire, and the Boston Globe reports that Joan may have been sexually abused as a young girl. It's likely we'll never know what truly did happen to Joan Rich on that October day, 55 years ago. 2. A.J. Bro. A.J. Bro was a recovering alcoholic who turned his life around after a drunk driving arrest. He was an important member of the Easy Does It Club, a local Alcoholics Anonymous chapter where he was involved as secretary. Known as a pillar of the community his daughter said he prided himself that he was available around the clock to talk and offer support for others who were in need. Like almost every other night August 28, 1991, found AJ in the Easy Does It Club attending a meeting. He left at around 8.30 in the evening and stopped at a local convenience store to pick up a carton of milk on his way home. Sometime after picking up the milk he disappeared. Two days later his car was found abandoned in a park across from the Easy Does It Club. A. J's wallet and checkbook were found underneath the driver's seat. A bag which contained $165 in the Easy Does It Club's funds were also found in the car. AJ had purchased $10 worth of gas not long before he went missing yet his car was low on fuel as if he had been driving around a while before parking the car in the park. His keys and the carton of milk were missing and were never located. The same day the car was found abandoned a person who knew Bro reported seeing him but was unaware that Brex was missing so he didn't report the sighting right away. His friend said AJ looked disheveled and was dressed in old dirty clothing. He described AJ as being nervous and in the company of three other men in a red compact car. This red compact car containing AJ and the three men were also seen by another witness who came forward. Two weeks later police received a note that said A.J. Bro. He was drunk at the time. Self-inflicted gunshot wound. Stomach. Drawstring cotton sack. Put in by friend. Rolled over a steep grassy bayou bank. Near dam. The note was signed Helen. The lake was searched by police but nothing of interest was found. A month after the disappearance a woman sitting on her porch about 20 miles from where A.J. disappeared saw a van pull up in front of her house. A man got out and offered to sell her frozen fish which she declined. She said to police the man resembled the missing A.J. Bro and he smelled of alcohol. Yet another witness came forward and said she saw three men forcing another into a car and drive away, 
The woman couldn't identify the fourth man who was being abducted but some feel she could have witnessed the abduction of AJ Bro. What do you think happened to AJ Bro? The weirdest aspect of the case has to be the fact that a man who knew AJ reported seeing him in the company of other men. And the note is weird as well. Was it a prank or did someone really know that he shot himself? 3. Misty Murray Misty was last seen on May 31, 1995, in her hometown of Godric, Ontario. She attended classes at the Godric District Collegiate Institute on the day of her disappearance and also visited the school nurse, for reasons that have not been made public. She called her adoptive mother, Anne Murray, at work at 1500 hours, and could not reach her but left a message. Misty never arrived home and has never been heard from again. Misty's biological mother, Darlene Oldfield, gave her up for adoption in 1980. Misty spent several years in foster care before being adopted by Anne and Stephen Murray in 1983. Her adoptive parents described her as a friendly, outgoing child who initially performed well in school, but when she reached adolescence she developed personal problems and her grades fell. Misty re-established contact with Oldfield and met her in person eight months before her disappearance. They were planning a weekend trip together and also were considering living together for the summer. Investigators initially believed Misty had run away from home. However, she had been very excited about the upcoming weekend visit with Oldfield and had already packed her suitcase, which was left behind when she vanished. She also left $200 on her bedroom dresser. Misty's adult boyfriend, Jeremy Cook, says he last saw her on May 30th, and he cashed a check and paid his rent that day. However, bank records show that Cook actually cashed the check on May 31st, the day Misty disappeared. There were reported sightings of Misty at Cook's apartment on May 31st or June 1st, but these have not been confirmed. Over the course of several days in early June, a number of area teenagers who knew Misty reported seeing her and speaking with her several times in Godric and in nearby Clinton, Ontario. In late June, there were possible sightings of her in the Dundas, Adelaide area of London, Ontario, which is frequented by runaways and homeless children. The London witnesses reported that Misty was involved with drugs and prostitution, and that she left London with her pimp because of the publicity about her disappearance. Police officers in Toronto, Ontario reported seeing someone matching Misty's description begging on the streets. None of the sightings have been confirmed, however. Authorities quickly discarded the runaway theory and, in September 1995, charged Stephen with murdering Misty. His trial was in 1997. Prosecutors stated that on the day of Misty's disappearance, Stephen took her out of Snug Harbor into Lake Huron, murdered her, and dumped her body near the center of the lake, where cold temperatures would keep it from surfacing. No motive for the alleged crime was offered. Stephen admitted to going out on Lake Huron the day Misty vanished, but said it was only for a very short trip. Multiple witnesses confirmed that Stephen had been on dry land at the time the prosecution said he was killing Misty, and the jury took less than an hour to acquit Stephen of all charges. Investigators have searched Lake Huron several times for Misty's remains. They stated that, in spite of his acquittal, they still believe Stephen murdered her. A later audit of the investigation into Misty's case criticized police for failing to follow up on sightings and leads and focusing on the weak theory of Stephen's guilt. The Murrays divorced after Misty's disappearance. In 2000, they held a memorial service for Misty. In 2002, they sued the police for $2.15 million for malicious prosecution and the failure to disclose vital evidence which would have exonerated Stephen sooner. Misty remains missing and it is unclear whether foul play was a factor in her case. Her adoptive parents believe she ran away from home but is now deceased, possibly murdered by other street children. Misty's biological mother also believes she is dead. The Charlie Project is profiling her case due to the circumstances involved. 4. Bridget Pendle Williamson Pendle Williamson was following the band Grateful Dead around the country when she disappeared. She had been doing that for several years prior to her disappearance. She was last known to be in the vicinity of Cap Street near 16th and 19th Streets in San Francisco, California. Her family has not heard from her since late 1996. She is considered in danger due to her failure to contact them. Pendle Williamson has been known to travel in and between California. Vermont, Kansas, Oregon, New York and Arizona. She may now be homeless or in a methadone program. Pendle Williamson is a former modeling student at the Barbies and Modeling School, 
and has also worked as a registered nurse. She was licensed to practice nursing in Vermont but has not worked in that profession since 1995, and her Vermont license has since lapsed. She had once been married and has a child, but got involved with drugs and bad company in the early 90s. The last positive sign of Penna Williamson is from April 1997, when she arrested for prostitution in San Francisco, California. She never showed up for her court date. One of her friends says she has not seen her since 1998 or 1999. Penda Williamson is believed to have spent many nights on the streets of the Tenderloin and Mission areas of San Francisco and may have stayed at the following San Francisco hotels, the Royan in the 400 block of Valencia Street, the All-Star in the 2700 block of 16th Street, the Eula, and the 16th Street Hotel. She may have worked as a prostitute in the area of 16th and 19th Streets, off Cap Street, her last known address was in the 300 block of Ellis Street in San Francisco, in a hotel room which she and a male friend rented by the week. Pendle Williamson's sister wrote Jack Boken, who is serving prison time for attacking homeless San Francisco prostitutes, and asked if he was involved in Pendle Williamson's case. Boken wrote back and denied having anything to do with the missing woman. He has not been ruled out as a suspect in her disappearance but there is no evidence to connect him to Pendle Williamson and he has never been charged in connection with her case. Investigators believe Boken killed some prostitutes who were never identified, but he has not been charged in those cases either. In March 2004, Pendle Williamson's sister, Jacqueline Horn, traveled to San Francisco to search for her in the city's homeless communities. Several people said Pendle Williamson bore a striking resemblance to a local homeless drifter known only as the Crier. The San Francisco Chronicle photographed the Crier for a feature on homeless people and Horn believed the photo resembles her sister, but she could not make a positive identification. A copy of that photograph is posted below this case summary. The Crier has not been located or identified. It is unknown if she and Pendle Williamson are the same person. Horn died in February 2006 at age 29. Pendle Williamson's case remains unsolved. Santa Cruz, California authorities are investigating her disappearance. 5. Elizabeth Kemble. Kemble was a student at Central Texas College and attended classes before leaving for her part-time job at the 7-Eleven store on Rancier Avenue in Colleen, Texas on April 25, 1988. After work she went to a group study at her boyfriend's residence, about 30 miles away from her own home. She and her boyfriend got into an argument and she said she wanted to go home, and he refused to take her, so she left alone sometime between 9.30 and 2300 hours. Campbell never arrived home. Her family didn't realize she was missing until the next morning. A clerk at another 7-Eleven store on Highway 190 in Copperas Cove, Texas reported seeing Campbell the night of her disappearance. The clerk said a man driving a light green gremlin, whom she thought was a Central Texas college student, dropped her off. The 7-Eleven employees let her use their phone to call her boyfriend. She asked him to come and pick her up, but they got into another argument and Campbell decided to call her brother instead. This would have been a long-distance call and she didn't want to make it on the store's phone, so she went outside to use the pay phone. She has never been heard from again. The next morning, when Campbell's parents couldn't find her, they attempted to report her missing. The police refused to accept a missing person's report until 72 hours had passed, because Campbell was an adult. Her parents searched for her, and investigated her disappearance on their own over the next three days. Campbell's parents went to the Central Texas College campus and were able to locate the man who dropped her off at the 7-Eleven. He said he had been working late at the college computer lab, saw Campbell walking down the service road and recognized her as a fellow student at the college. He offered her a ride to Copperas Cove, which was as far as he was going. The 7-Eleven where he dropped her off of was 17 miles from her home. Campbell's purse was located over 180 miles away, off Interstate 10 in Ozona, Texas, in 1992, four years after she was reported missing. Someone turned it into the Crockett County Sheriff's Department, but they never recorded who had done this or when. The then-sheriff thought the purse had been turned in sometime between April 1988 and January 1989. Authorities stated that there was no physical evidence relating to Kimball's disappearance inside the purse. It contained her social security card, military identification card and credit card, but her makeup, hairbrush and keys were missing. Foul play is suspected in her case.
Sometime after her disappearance, authorities released a sketch of a possible suspect. The sketch is posted below this case summary. Campbell resided with her parents in Limpasses, Texas in 1988. She planned to transfer to Texas A&M University in the autumn of that year and study marine biology. Her mother described her as a very naive, trusting young woman. Campbell's parents are still alive, but elderly and in poor health. Her case remains unsolved. 6. August Riger. Two years ago this month, an Oklahoma City man disappeared along a mountain trail, while hiking with his family in Ecuador, leaving no trace of what might have happened. The family of August Riger still waits for answers. Just this month, a new post on the Find August Riger Facebook page reminded its more than 6,400 followers that the search continues for the man, who would be 20 now, and that new pieces of information have been discovered, but won't be shared so as to not jeopardize the search. The beautiful thing about life is that it continues, and with each new day is another chance that he will be found, the post reads. Your prayers and positive comments have been an immense comfort for August's family. It is truly amazing how a tragedy like this can bring so many people together. Riger was an 18-year-old, high-achieving student when he was last seen on June 16, 2013, Father's Day. An international baccalaureate valedictorian at Classen School of Advanced Studies, a National Merit Scholar and an Oklahoma Academic Scholar, Riger's achievements in the classroom attracted the attention of the University of Oklahoma, which awarded him a full scholarship. He was scheduled to start classes that fall. Tall and slender with long brown hair and the beginnings of a beard, he had a thirst to explore the world, friends and family say. While on a post-graduation trip to Ecuador with his mother, father and brother, the family decided to hike a trail near their resort in the city of Banos. Toward the end of the hike, Riger walked ahead of the group and planned to meet them at the top of the trail. When the family reached the trail summit, Riger wasn't there. Figuring they'd missed him, the family returned to the resort to search for him. I thought he must have gone on, Riger's father, Chris, said then. You couldn't get lost. There's only two trails. You can see the whole town. All you have to do is go down. When Riger wasn't at the hotel, the family grew frantic and contacted police and the U.S. Embassy. A team including police, firefighters, volunteers and the Ecuadorian military searched for Riger. A week later, President Barack Obama declared Riger a missing patriot. Riger's parents spent the majority of that summer in Bono's searching for their son. Family members and friends also joined in the search, flying to Ecuador from Oklahoma and other states. Initial updates on the Find August Riger Facebook included information about the search, possible sightings, and words of encouragement from family and friends. In October 2013, six pictures drawn by Riger's mother, Rhonda, depicting her side by side with him, were posted to the page. His father wrote and performed a song on video, a sorrowful tune of grief and longing for his son. But as the days turned to weeks, the updates became less frequent. In December of 2013, Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa met with a representative of the Riger family. The family said the South American leader told them he'd made it his mission to find the teen, and dozens of others missing in his country. Now with President Correa stepping up and wanting to make this his platform, which is a very bold move, we're so happy because we think that will help in finding August, Christy Riger, August Sand, said in an interview at the time. His face is everywhere. I don't think there's anyone down there, who, doesn't know who he is. In May of 2014, the family announced that Ecuadorian citizens had reported seeing August to the government. The government did not release the location of any alleged sightings. On the one-year anniversary of Riger's disappearance, his family posted a poem written by Rhonda expressing how she felt the day her son disappeared. Then the Facebook page went silent with no postings for nearly a year. Early this month, a new post asked for continued prayers, and offered reassurance that the search continues in Ecuador. It included a picture of a young, short-haired, smiling August in a red sweater staring into the camera. Sometimes updates are hard, begins a post on the page. Not because we have lost hope or that the search is over, but because it is a reminder that more time has passed, and August is still not with his family. The family did not respond to requests for comment. 7. Rachel Pratt. Rachel was last seen watching a movie inside her family's residence in Garden City, Kansas at approximately 1 o'clock a.m. 
on January 16, 1995. She disappeared under suspicious circumstances and has never been heard from again. Rachel left all of her clothing and personal belongings at her home, including her identification and social security card, only her coat was missing. Five days after her disappearance, some girls claimed to have seen her talking on a payphone with her boyfriend. They say she left the phone with her boyfriend after asking the girls for a ride, then went into Dylan's grocery store. The sighting has not been confirmed and her boyfriend denies having been with her after she vanished. Five days after she disappeared, a group of girls claimed to have seen Rachel talking on a payphone outside of a local grocery store. Rachel's boyfriend was with her, and after she handed the phone to him, she went over to the girls and asked them for a ride. When they turned her down, Rachel walked into the store, and that's the last time she was seen. Rachel was supposed to be a witness against her boyfriend, who was being prosecuted for unlawful sexual relations with her. The boyfriend was charged with aggravated indecent liberties with a child. Because Rachel disappeared before she could testify, the charges were dropped. They started dating when Rachel was a 14-year-old high school freshman and her boyfriend was an 18-year-old senior. He was her first boyfriend. Rachel's mother found out she was pregnant after Rachel was arrested for attempting to shoplift a home pregnancy test from Walmart. She gave her statement to the police at that time. There is no evidence to indicate that Rachel has given birth. There is also no record of her ever receiving a driver's license, a copy of her birth certificate, or a social security card. She may have remained in the Kansas City area after her disappearance. There have been no sightings of her in many years, but authorities remain hopeful that she is still alive. Rachel has seven siblings. Her mother still lives at the same address and has kept the same phone number. Authorities believe foul play was involved in her disappearance. Her boyfriend has never been ruled out as a suspect, but he maintains his innocence in her case. Some agencies may classify Rachel's disappearance as that of an endangered runaway. Since Rachel was underage and her boyfriend was legally an adult, he was charged with aggravated indecent liberties with a child shortly before her disappearance. Rachel was set to testify as a witness against her boyfriend, but after she went missing, the charges against him were dropped. Naturally, this caused authorities to zero in on the boyfriend as a suspect, but he has always maintained his innocence and denied being with Rachel during the alleged sighting at the grocery store. There is no evidence that Rachel ever gave birth to her unborn child, and the circumstances behind her disappearance are still unknown. 8. Gordon Collins. In September of 1991, a disoriented, penniless, and obviously out of place young American man wandered into the Mexican village of Colonia Vicente Guerrero, 300 miles south of San Diego. He lingered for months, living on handouts and the charity of strangers. Many now believe the man was Gordon Collins, who had been missing for five months. In April 1991, Gordon was vacationing with his girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, and another couple, near Santa Rosalia a popular deep-sea fishing port near the middle of the Baja Peninsula. Four days after they arrived, the group rented a boat at a local hotel. Gordon's friend, Wayne Schwartz, had fished off the Baja coast many times. As the group left port, a fisherman on his way in warned them that a storm was brewing. Several hours later, a fierce storm hit the area. Gordon and his friends never returned. The next day, a hotel employee discovered the bodies of Gordon's girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, and Wayne Schwartz. But Gordon and Wayne's wife, Arlene Burlington, were never found. Gordon's father, John Collins, described what the searchers found, the bodies and all the paraphernalia out of the boat was all within one square mile of each other, cause I talked to the fellow that fished the bodies out and so we say, hey, where's the other two jackets? Where's the other two people? For three days, the United States Coast Guard searched a 250-mile area but found nothing. It seemed obvious that Gordon and Arlian had also perished. In time, Gordon and Arlian's parents were asked to sign death certificates. However, reports that Gordon was still alive had already begun to come in from Mexico. Some thought he might be suffering from amnesia. When Gordon Collins' parents traveled to the site of the accident, they found two Mexican fishermen who said they had seen a man matching Gordon's description wander out of the ocean. He was wearing only shorts and was covered in cuts. They said they saw him trying to board a bus. John Collins recalls his reaction, I was very excited. Things started fitting together because this is where the accident happened. 
They found the bodies just a mile and a half off of the shore. It's gotta be Gordy. Around the same time, a man named Jose Peralta also sighted Gordon on a nearby beach. Gordon's mother Mary Lou Collins talked to him. Jose said that Gordy said he was waiting for friends he went fishing with and could he have Jose's blanket, cause he was going to sleep on the beach there at Cabo and wait for his friends. John Collins tells of other confirmations, on one trip, we were headed toward La Paz and we stopped at a few of these taco places and they said, yeah, seen him an hour ago. So we went on down for probably another three or four miles and we stopped again, and the guy says yeah, we seen him about 30 minutes ago. So we finally got right into town and they say, yeah, within five minutes. And I don't know what happened, but everybody just clammed up. We couldn't get any more or more information. Over the next three months, Gordon Collins was spotted at least 50 times in seven different locations, all in the area of La Paz and Cabo San Lucas, at the southern end of the Baja Peninsula. Gordon's parents hired Bill Garcia, a private investigator, who alerted newspapers in Baja. After the articles ran, Garcia received several calls from a village 300 miles south of Tijuana. Raul Amador says he remembers Gordon vividly. He was four, five months here in town. Everybody knows him. Bill Garcia believes the villagers, we've shown them pictures and everyone recognizes him and they're positive that it's him. The people that have talked to him know some things about Gordon and feel confident that he is there. When the man identified as Gordon was arrested for stealing food, the local sheriff brought in James Hatfield, an American living in the village, to translate. James said he was sure the man he met was Gordon Collins, there's no doubt in my mind it's Gordon, because when we met him in jail, I introduced myself to him and he gave me his name Gordy. And then when the flyer came out, it's right there on the flyer, Gordon. And you can't get the two pictures mixed up. It's the same. But Bill Garcia didn't make it in time. He moved on shortly before we were able to get to the area and we haven't been able to find where he's gone from there. Over the next year, sporadic sightings of Gordon continued. The U.S. consulate has officially reversed its position and no longer presumes that Gordon Collins is dead. John Collins holds on to hope that he may see his son again, you can't just up and give up, because it's your son. I know it keeps me driving, it keeps me going. And I want to get him home. 9. Shonda Stansberry. A missed opportunity that cost crucial minutes in the Shonda Stansberry investigation has police frustrated, as the anniversary of the young mother's disappearance approaches. Captain Andy Jackson, head of investigations for the Roanoke Rapids Police Department, said the fact the last sighting of Stansberry, reported to police on December 14, 2006, was delayed by unforeseen circumstances is frustrating. That last sighting of Stansberry, who was reported missing by her mother Gloria Bedgood on December 7, 2006, came at the intersection of U.S. Highway 158 and Highway 903 at the Information Grocery at around 23.27, December 14, 2006. A female caller told emergency communications personnel she had seen Stansberry, nude and apparently bleeding from the nose, running across Highway 158 toward a wooded area near 903 having emerged from behind the information grocery wearing nothing and being chased by two black males, one described as dark-skinned, about 5 feet, 8 inches tall with a stocky build, wearing a ball cap and blue jeans, the other with lighter skin, about 5 feet, 6 inches tall, with dreadlocks and wearing blue jeans with patches on them. The caller told police Stansberry was calling for help as the men pursued her. The problem with this lead, Jackson said, is the caller didn't report it for 12 minutes. This certainly wasn't the caller's fault. The caller later told police she did not have her cell phone with her at the time of the sighting. Additionally, the call was relayed from Warren County to Brunswick County, then and finally to Halifax County, costing, Jackson said, perhaps another 7 minutes. Realistically, we could have lost about 20 minutes, Jackson said. Stansberry, who was known to have trouble with drugs and alcohol, was reported missing a week prior to this sighting. Jackson began tracking her movements at the West Side Grocery on West 10th Street in Roanoke Rapids, where she was seen being dropped off at around 6 a.m. December 9. Stansberry was seen at a residence in the Great Falls Circle area the same day, a fact Jackson was able to confirm. That evening, she walked to a residence on Oakland Street, then back to the Great Falls Circle residence. 
She was asked to leave the residence on Great Falls Circle that night, and there were no confirmed sightings of her other than the sighting at Information Grocery December 14. Jackson said he believes those men caught Stansberry and something very sinister has happened to her, though multiple searches of the area where the caller reported Stansberry was seen yielded no substantial evidence. He said police are treating the investigation as a death investigation. She has not used her social security number since her disappearance, Jackson said. And she was known to have problems with drugs and alcohol, but she has not run across any law enforcement personnel anywhere in the United States since 2006. In the meantime, Jackson said the holidays are particularly difficult for Stansberry's family, as the mystery of her disappearance remains. Nobody disappears off the face of the earth without somebody knowing something about it, Jackson said. I just wish anybody who knows anything would please come forward and help this family out. They go through so much every year this time of year. As the holidays roll around every year, her family remembers Shonda and there's an empty spot at the table where she should be and they are asking and looking for closure. Stansberry is described as a white female, 5 feet, 5 inches tall, weighing 120 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. She has a tattoo of a rose with the name Toby on her left breast, and a heart with a ribbon through it with the name Brianna on her right calf. She was missing her upper four front teeth. She was 24 years old when she disappeared. 10. Renee LaMana Renee LaMana's disappearance has stymied police in two states, a private investigator and family members who are offering a reward for any information on her whereabouts. It's a mystery. Ocean City Detective Sergeant William Wyland said. It's as if she dropped off the face of the earth. The case is the city's only active missing persons investigation. La Mana was a 35-year-old student at Bronx Community College who disappeared while visiting her sister in Ocean City. She left the Summers Point Bar about 21.15, January 8, 1994, and was never seen or heard from again. La Mana quarreled with her boyfriend, Robert Saberi in their New York apartment the day before she came to the shore. While Saberi was sleeping, La Mana left the apartment and was found wandering the New York City streets barefoot in freezing temperatures. A Good Samaritan called police and an ambulance took La Mana to a Queens Hospital psychiatric unit at 2 a.m. She was given no medication, but doctors kept her under observation until 6 a.m. Saberi said La Mana had been acting strangely that night. She was depressed. We had soup for dinner and she tried to tell me I was trying to kill her, he said. That was the first time she ever said such a thing. La Mana refused to be admitted to the hospital. A doctor called her sister, Margaret, who arranged to have a friend of the family accompany La Mana in a limousine to Margaret's Ocean City home on the 2400 block of Wesley Avenue. Margaret La Mana, a Philadelphia doctor, said she tried to cheer up her sister, who appeared distraught. They ordered takeout from Mario's Pizza and talked about vacation plans. I was putting dishes in the dishwasher when she said she was going out for some fresh air, Margaret Lawmana said. Before her sister could protest, Renee Lawmana bolted outside into the 20-degree air wearing only a terry cloth bathrobe, silk pajama bottoms, a sweatshirt, white grew socks and hospital slippers. Margaret Lawmana said she tried to catch up to her, but it was too dark to see. She went back to her house where she found one of the discarded slippers and called police. About an hour later, a bloodhound named Whiskey led Cape May County Sheriff's officers, two blocks along the beach and back to Central Avenue, where they found the rope. She had no money, no credit cards, no ID or anything, Margaret Lawmana said. Police believe somebody picked Lawmana up on Central Avenue, and dropped her off in Summers Point, the last place she was seen. Dolores Loft a bar on the second floor of the waterfront, was nearly empty because of the low temperatures January 8. It was nasty cold out, said the bar's owner, Dolores Beck. That night was freezing, I'll never forget it. It was one of the coldest nights we've had. A woman who was not wearing a coat walked in looking distracted and nervous, Beck said. She sat at the bar and ordered a scotch on the rocks. She said nothing else, but simply stared expressionless, Beck said. Beck and a customer seated at the corner of the bar asked if she was feeling all right, but the woman did not respond. She didn't say a word and walked out, Beck said. I knew something was wrong and called police. A Northfield car dealer reported seeing Lawman in May 1995, but the sighting was unconfirmed. 
Beck was the last known person to have seen her. She said she did not immediately recognize Renee LaMana. Only when police said Ocean City was looking for the woman did it dawn on her. Wyland said he is not convinced it was LaMana who came to the bar that night, but Beck is certain. She had met the family just a few months earlier when they came to the restaurant for dinner. It was her. I know it was her, she said. Beck said she is haunted by the memory of that night and the nagging thought that she should have prevented her from leaving. Every day I drive down Shore Road, and if I see someone walking, I look to see if it's her, she said. A million things go through your mind. I have sisters and daughters, too. Ocean City Police keep a torn manila envelope filled with reams of reports, faxes, letters and hand-scrawled notes. The case file contains every lead detectives have checked. Each turned up nothing. There is a bill from a Motel 6 in Newcastle, Dell, smeared with red fingerprint dust. There is a Polaroid photograph of a woman who resembled La Mana, whom police pulled off a casino bus at a Garden State Parkway rest stop. There was a list her parents compiled of La Mana's friends, co-workers and classmates. Each bears a little red X, indicating she had not contacted them. Her social security number has not turned up in any new state or federal records. A family friend conducted an exhaustive search of the internet, but nothing appeared. After a segment on La Mana aired on the television show Unsolved Mysteries, police received 44 calls from places as far away as Portland, or, and Naples, Florida none turned up any solid clues. This case was cold from the time it started, said Andy Sloan, a private investigator the family hired in 1994. The retired FBI agent tracked down dozens of fugitives during his career. Nothing has frustrated him more than this disappearance, he said. Mrs. LaMana has done everything possible to find that child, he said. It's got to be a living hell for a parent. What could be worse? Ocean City Police filed a report with Interpol in October in the hopes that LaMana might be found overseas. Last week, Pakistani police interviewed Saberi's father, who had lived with his son in LaMana for several months in their New York apartment. He was so shaken. Saberi said. How come police bothered my father? Saberi, a New York taxi driver, came to Ocean City in 1994, to see for himself what might have become of her. How could she disappear from that area? He asked. It's very safe. It's a wealthy area with no crime at all. Wyland said it is possible La Mana simply cut off all ties to her past and began a new life elsewhere. The first question we'd ask her if we found her is, do you want to be found? he said. La Mana had spent time in Africa with the Peace Corps. La Mana had a master's degree in history from the University of Scranton and spoke four languages. She worked as a real estate agent in Queens, a hostess at a posh Manhattan restaurant and as a saleswoman at several clothing stores. She converted from Catholicism to Islam and became a devout Muslim. La Mana hasn't made a single phone call to any friends, co-workers, classmates or relatives in five years. She hasn't mailed a single birthday card or letter. Could she go five years without any contact? Her mother, Anne La Mana, doesn't think so. She always sent a rose on Mother's Day, she said. We were not estranged. We were a very close-knit family. Saberi said he suspects foul play. He does not believe La Mana could have built a new life without money or identification. Even though she traveled extensively around the world, she led a relatively sheltered life. Saberi said. She's not hiding, he said. She was not the kind of person who was completely independent. And La Mana said her daughter might not appear streetwise but was savvy enough to survive on her own. She was a very versatile and cosmopolitan girl, she said. Both parents are in poor health, which has hampered their search. They no longer make seasonal trips from Florida to Ocean City to paste new flyers, or comb the streets in search of new leads. The real victims are the parents, Wyland said. You can see how they've aged since their daughter's disappearance. The worst part of it is not knowing. But Anne La Mana is hopeful that one day she will find out what happened to her daughter. It's as though she vanished, she said. But somebody must know something.